If the Germans were going to stop the invasion anywhere, it would be at Omaha Beach. It was an obvious landing site, the only sand beach between the mouth of the Douve to the west and Aramanches to the east, a distance of almost 40 kilometres. On both ends of Omaha, the cliffs were more or less perpendicular. The sand at Omaha Beach is golden in colour, firm and fine, perfect for sunbathing and picnicking and digging, but in extent the beach is constricted. It is slightly crescent-shaped, about 10 kilometres long overall. At low tide there is a stretch of firm sand of 300 to 400 metres in distance. At high tide the distance from the waterline to the 1 to 3 metre bank of shingle is but a few metres. In 1944, the shingle, now mostly gone, was impassable to vehicles. On the western third of the beach, beyond the shingle, there was a part wood, part masonry seawall from one to four metres in height. Inland of the seawall, there was a paved promenade beach road, then a V-shaped anti-tank ditch as much as two metres deep, then a flat swampy area, then a steep bluff that ascended 30 metres or more. A man could climb the bluff, but a vehicle could not. The grass-covered slopes appeared to be featureless when viewed from any distance, but in fact they contained many small folds or irregularities that proved to be a critical physical feature of the battlefield. There were five small drawers or ravines that sloped gently up to the tableland above the beach. A paved road led off the beach at exit D1 to Vierville, at Les Moulins, exit D3. A dirt road led up to Saint-Laurent, the third draw, exit E1 had only a path leading up to the tableland. The fourth draw, E3, had a dirt road leading to Colville. The last draw had a dirt path at exit F1. No tactician could have devised a better defensive situation. A narrow enclosed battlefield, with no possibility of outflanking it, many natural obstacles for the attacker to overcome, an ideal place to build fixed fortifications and a trench system on the slope of the bluff and on the high ground looking down on a wide, open killing field for any infantry trying to cross no man's land. The Allied planners hated the idea of assaulting Omaha Beach, but it had to be done. This was as obvious to Rommel as to Eisenhower. Both commanders recognised that if the Allies invaded in Normandy, they would have to include Omaha Beach in the landing sites. Otherwise, the gap between Utah and the British beaches would be too great. The waters offshore were heavily mined, so too the beaches, the promenade which also had concertina wire along its length, and the bluff. Rommel had placed more beach obstacles here than at Utah. He had twelve strong points holding 88s, 75s and mortars. He had dozens of towbrooks and machine-gun pillboxes, supported by an extensive trench system. Everything the Germans had learned in World War I about how to stop a frontal assault by infantry Rommel put to work at Omaha. He laid out the firing positions at angles to the beach to cover the tidal flat and beach shelf with crossing fire, plunging fire and grazing fire from all types of weapons. He prepared artillery positions along the cliffs at either end of the beach capable of delivering enfilade fire from 88s all across Omaha. The trench system included underground quarters and magazines connected by tunnels. The strong points were concentrated near the entrances to the drawers, which were further protected by large cement roadblocks. The larger artillery pieces were protected to the seaward by concrete wing walls. There was not one inch of the beach that had not been pre-sighted for both grazing and plunging fire. Watching the American landing craft approach, the German defenders could hardly believe their eyes. Holy smoke, here they are, Lieutenant Fröking declared. But that's not possible, that's not possible. He put down his binoculars and rushed to his command post in a bunker near Vierville. Landing craft on our left, off Vierville, making for the beach, Seppel. Hein Severlo in Widerstandsnesten, 62, called out. They must be crazy. Sergeant Crone declared. Are they going to swim ashore, right under our muzzles? The colonel of the artillery regiment passed down a strict order. Hold your fire until the enemy is coming up to the waterline. All along the bluff, German soldiers watched the landing craft approach, their fingers on the triggers of machine guns, rifles, artillery fuses, or holding mortar rounds. In Bunker 62, Fröking was at the telephone. 
giving the range to gunners a couple of kilometres inland. Target Dora, all guns, range 4850, basic direction 20 plus, impact fuse. Captain Robert Walker of HQ Company, 116th Regiment, 29th Division, later described the defences in front of Viaville. The cliff-like ridge was covered with well-concealed foxholes and many semi-permanent bunkers. The bunkers were practically unnoticeable from the front. Their firing openings were toward the flank so that they could bring flanking crossfire to the beach as well as all the way up the slope of the bluff. The bunkers had diagrams of fields of fire, and these were framed under glass and mounted on the walls beside the firing platforms. A.J. Liebling, who covered the invasion for the New Yorker, climbed the bluff a few days after D-Day. The trenches were deep, narrow, and so convoluted that an attacking force at any point could be fired on from several directions, he wrote. Important knots in the system, like the command post and mortar emplacements, were of concrete. The command post was sunk at least 25 feet into the ground and was faced with brick on the inside. The garrison had slept in underground bomb-proofs, with timbered ceilings and wooden floors. To Liebling, it looked like a regular Maginot line. Four things gave the Allies the notion that they could successfully assault this all-but-impregnable position. First, Allied intelligence said that the fortifications and trenches were manned by the 716th Infantry Division, a low-quality unit made up of Poles and Russians with poor morale. At Omaha, intelligence reckoned that there was only one battalion of about 800 troops to man the defences. Second, the B-17s assigned to the air bombardment would hit the beach with everything they had, destroying or at least neutralising the bunkers and creating craters on the beach and bluff that would be usable as foxholes for the infantry. Third, the naval bombardment, culminating with the LCTR's rockets, would finish off anything left alive and moving after the B-17s finished. The infantry from the 29th and 1st Divisions going into Omaha were told that their problems would begin when they got to the top of the bluff and started to move inland toward their D-Day objectives. The fourth cause for confidence that the job would be done was that 40,000 men with 3,500 motorised vehicles were scheduled to land at Omaha on D-Day. In the event, none of the above worked. The intelligence was wrong. Instead of the contemptible 716th Division, the quite capable 352nd Division was in place. Instead of one German battalion to cover the beach, there were three. The cloud cover and late arrival caused the B-17s to delay their release until they were as much as five kilometres inland. Not a single bomb fell on the beach or bluff. The naval bombardment was too brief and generally inaccurate, and in any case, it concentrated on the big fortifications above the bluff. Finally, most of the rockets fell short, most of them landing in the surf, killing thousands of fish, but no Germans. Captain Walker, on an LCI, recalled that just before H hour, I took a look toward the shore and my heart took a dive. I couldn't believe how peaceful, how untouched and how tranquil the scene was. The terrain was green, all buildings and houses were intact, the church steeples were proudly and defiantly standing in place. Where, I yelled to no one in particular, is the damned air corps? The overlaw plan for Omaha was elaborate and precise. It had the 116th Regiment of the 29th Division attached to the 1st Division for this day only going in on the right, supported by C Company of the 2nd Ranger Battalion the 16th Regiment of the 1st Division would go in on the left. It would be a linear attack, with the two regiments going in by companies abreast. There were eight sectors from right to left named Charlie, Dog Green, Dog White, Dog Red, Easy Green, Easy Red, Fox Green and Fox Red. The 116th sectors ran from Charlie to Easy Green. The first waves would consist of two battalions from each of the regiments, landing in a column of companies, with the 3rd Battalion coming in behind. Assault teams would cover every inch of beach, firing M1s, 30 calibre machine guns, bars, bazookas, 60 mm mortars and flamethrowers. Ahead of the assault teams would be DD tanks, Navy underwater demolition teams and Army engineers. 
Each assault team and the supporting units had specific tasks to perform, all geared to opening the exits. As the infantry suppressed whatever fire the Germans could bring to bear, the demolition teams would blow the obstacles and mark the paths through them with flags, so that as the tide came in, the coxswains would know where it was safe to go. Next would come the following waves of landing craft, bringing in reinforcements on a tight, strict schedule designed to put firepower ranging from M1s to 105mm howitzers into the battle exactly when needed, plus more tanks, trucks, jeeps, medical units, traffic control people, headquarters, communication units, all the physical support and administrative control required by two overstrength divisions of infantry, conducting an all-out offensive. By H plus 120 minutes, the vehicles would be driving up the opened drawers to the top of the bluff and starting to move inland toward their D-Day objectives, first of all the villages of Vierville, Saint-Laurent and Colville, then heading west toward Pointe-du-Hoc or south to take Trevière, eight kilometres from Omaha. Eisenhower's little aphorism that plans are everything before the battle, useless once it is joined, was certainly the case at Omaha. Nothing worked according to the plan, which was indeed useless the moment the Germans opened fire on the assault forces, and even before. With the exception of Company A, 116th, no unit landed where it was supposed to. Half of E Company was more than a kilometre off target, the other half more than two kilometres to the east of its assigned sector. This was a consequence of winds and tide. A northwest wind of 10 to 18 knots created waves of 3 to 4 feet, sometimes as much as 6 feet, which pushed the landing craft from right to left. So did the tidal current, which with the rising tide ran at a velocity of 2.7 knots. By H hour, not only were the boats out of position, but the men in them were cramped, seasick, miserable. Most had climbed down their rope nets into the craft four hours or more earlier. The waves came crashing over the gunnels. Every LCVP and LCA shipped water. In most of them, the pumps could not carry the load, so the troops had to bail with their helmets. At least ten of the two hundred boats in the first wave swamped. Most of the troops were picked up later by Coast Guard rescue craft, often after hours in the water. Many drowned. Another disheartening sight to the men in the surviving boats was the glimpse of GIs struggling in life preservers and on rafts, personnel from the foundered DD tanks. In general, the men of the first wave were exhausted and confused even before the battle was joined. Still, the misery caused by the spray hitting them in the face with each wave and by their seasickness was such that they were eager to hit the beach, feeling that nothing could be worse than riding on those damned Higgins boats. The only comforting thing was those tremendous naval shells zooming over their heads, but even they were hitting the top of the bluff or further inland, not the beach or the slope. At H minus five minutes the fire lifted. Chief Electrician's mate Alfred Sears was in the last LCVP of 16 in the first wave. Going in, the ensign had told him, all the German strong points will be knocked out by the time we hit the beach. Sears went on. We were so confident of this that on the way in most of my men and I were sitting on top of the engine room decking of the landing craft, enjoying the show, fascinated by the barrage from the rocket ships. About 1,000 rockets shattered the beach directly where we were to land. It looked pretty good. Litter Joe Smith was a Navy beachmaster. His job was to put up flags to guide the landing craft from A Company, 116th Regiment, his Higgins boat may have been the first to hit the beach. The Germans let us alone on the beach. We didn't know why, we could see the Germans up there looking down on us. It was a weird feeling. We were right in front of a German 88 gun emplacement, but fortunately for us they were set to cover down the beach and not toward the sea, so they could not see us. A Higgins boat carrying an assault team from A Company came in behind Smith. The men in it figured that what they had been told to expect had come true. The air and naval bombardments had wiped out the opposition. The ramp went down. Target Dora! Fire! Lieutenant Ferking shouted into the telephone. When the battery opened fire, eager German gunners throughout the area pulled their triggers. 
To Fröking's left, there were three MG42 positions. To his front, a fortified mortar position. On the forward slopes of the bluff infantrymen in trenches, they exploded into action. We hit the sandbar, electrician's mate Sears recalled, dropped the ramp and then all hell poured loose on us. The soldiers in the boat received a hail of machine gun bullets. The army lieutenant was immediately killed, shot through the head. In the lead company a boat, LCA 1015, Capsney Taylor Fellers, and every one of his men were killed before the ramp went down. It just vaporised. No one ever learned whether it was the result of hitting a mine or getting hit by an 88. They put their ramp down, Navy Beachmaster Letit Joe Smith said of what he saw, and a German machine gun or two opened up and you could see the sand kick up right in front of the boat. No one moved. The coxswain stood up and yelled, and for some reason everything was quiet for an instant, and you could hear him as clear as a bell. He said, For Christ's sake, fellas, get out. I've got to go get another load. All across the beach, the German machine guns were hurling fire of monstrous proportions on the hapless Americans. One gunner, with Lieutenant Fröking at Strong Point 62, fired 12,000 rounds that morning. Because of the misplaced landings, the GIs were bunched together, with large gaps between groups, up to a kilometre in length, which allowed the Germans to concentrate their fire. As the Higgins boats and larger LCIs approached the beach, the German artillery fired at will, from the Tobruks and fortifications up the draws and on top of the bluff, and from the emplacements on the beach. Motor Machinist Charles Giraud, Coast Guard, was on LCI 94. His skipper was an old man of 32 years, a merchant mariner who did things his own way. His nickname was Popeye. He had stashed a supply of J&B scotch aboard and told the cook that his duty that day was to go around to the crew and keep giving them a drink until they didn't want any more or until we ran out. Essentially, we drank most of the day. Didn't have any food, but I drank all day and didn't get the least bit intoxicated. It had absolutely no effect. LCI 94 was in the first wave, right behind the Navy demolition teams and the beach marking crew. By this time, it was getting pretty hot. Popeye looked at our sign and said, Hell, I'm not going in there. We'll never get off that beach. So he aborted the run. The rest of the LCIs in our flotilla went in where they were supposed to go and none of them got off the beach. They were all shot up, which made our skipper go up in our esteem by one hell of a lot. Popeye cruised down the beach about a hundred metres, turned toward shore, dropped his stern anchor and went in at one-third speed until he ran aground twenty metres or so offshore. The ramps went down and the men from the 116th moved down them. As they disembarked, the ship lightened. Popeye had his engines put into reverse, used the small Briggs and Stratton motor to pull on the anchor chain and backed off. Five men from his 26-man crew were dead, killed by machine gun fire. Twenty of the 200 infantry men were killed before they reached the beach. P John Barnes, Company A, 116th, was in an LCA. As it approached the shore, line abreast with 11 other craft, someone shouted, Take a look! This is something that you will tell your grandchildren! If we live, Barnes thought. Ahead, he could see the single spire of the church at Veerville. A company was right on target. The LCA roared ahead, breasting the waves. Suddenly a swirl of water wrapped around my ankles, and the front of the craft dipped down. The water quickly reached our waist and we shouted to the other boats on each side. They waved in return. Our boat just fell away below me. I squeezed the carbon dioxide tube in my life belt. The buckle broke and it popped away. I turned to grab the back of the man behind me. I was going down under. I climbed on his back and pulled myself up in a panic. Heads bobbed up above the water. We could see the other boats moving off towards shore. Some men had wrapped May Wests around their weapons and inflated them. Barnes saw a rifle floating by, then a flamethrower with two May Wests around it. I hugged it tight but still seemed to be going down. I couldn't keep my head above the surface. I tried to pull the release straps on my jacket but I couldn't move. 
Lieutenant Gearing grabbed my jacket and used his bayonet to cut the straps and release me from the weight. I was all right now, I could swim. The assault team was about a kilometre offshore. Sergeant Laird wanted to swim in, but Lieutenant Gearing said, No, we'll wait and get picked up by some passing boat. But none would stop. The coxswain's orders were to go on in and leave the rescue work to others. After a bit, we heard a friendly shout of some limey voice in one of the LCAs. He stopped, his boat was empty. He helped us to climb on board, we recognised the coxswain. He was from the Empire Javelin. He wouldn't return to the beach. We asked how the others made out. He said he had dropped them off OK. We went back to the Empire Javelin, which we had left at 04 or so that morning. How long had it been? It seemed like just minutes. When I thought to ask, it was 13 mile. Barnes and his assault team were extraordinarily lucky. About 60% of the men of Company A came from one town, Bedford, Virginia. For Bedford, the first 15 minutes at Omaha was an unmitigated disaster. Companies G and F were supposed to come in to the immediate left of Company A, but they drifted a kilometre further east before landing, so all the Germans around the heavily defended Veerville draw concentrated their fire on Company A. When the ramps on the Higgins boats dropped, the Germans just poured the machine gun, artillery, and mortar fire on them. It was a slaughter. Of the 200-plus men of the company, only a couple of dozen survived, and virtually all of them were wounded. Sergeant Thomas Valance survived, barely. As we came down the ramp, we were in water about knee-high and started to do what we were trained to do, that is, move forward and then crouch and fire. One problem was we didn't quite know what to fire at. I saw some tracers coming from a concrete emplacement which, to me, looked mammoth. I never anticipated any gun emplacements being that big. I shot at it, but there was no way I was going to knock out a German concrete emplacement with a 30 caliber rifle. The tide was coming in, rapidly, and the men around Valance were getting hit. He found it difficult to stay on his feet. Like most infantry men, he was badly overloaded, soaking wet, exhausted, trying to struggle through wet sand and avoid the obstacles with mines attached to them. I abandoned my equipment, which was dragging me down into the water. It became evident rather quickly that we weren't going to accomplish very much. I remember floundering in the water with my hand up in the air, trying to get my balance, when I was first shot through the palm of my hand, then through the knuckle. Puffed. Henry Witt was rolling over toward me. I remember him saying, Sergeant, they're leaving us here to die like rats, just to die like rats. Valance was hit again, in the left thigh, by a bullet that broke his hip bone. He took two additional flesh wounds, his pack was hit twice, and the chin strap on his helmet was severed by a bullet. He crawled up the beach and staggered up against the seawall and sort of collapsed there and, as a matter of fact, spent the whole day in that same position. Essentially, my part in the invasion had ended by having been wiped out as most of my company was. The bodies of my buddies were washing ashore, and I was the one live body in amongst so many of my friends, all of whom were dead, in many cases very severely blown to pieces. On his boat, Lit and Edward Tidrick was first off. As he jumped from the ramp into the water, he took a bullet through his throat. He staggered to the sand, flopped down near Putleo Nash, and raised himself up to gasp, Advance with the wire cutters! At that instant, machine gun bullets ripped Tidrick from crown to pelvis. By Euro 640, only one officer from A Company was alive, Letty E. Ray Nance, and he had been hit in the heel and the belly. Every sergeant was either dead or wounded. On one boat, when the ramp was dropped, every man in the 30 man assault team was killed before any of them could get out. Pete George Roach was an assistant flamethrower. He weighed 125 pounds. He carried over 100 pounds of gear ashore, including his M1 rifle, ammunition, hand grenades, a five-gallon drum of flamethrower fluid, and assorted wrenches and a cylinder of nitrogen. We went down the ramp and the casualty rate was very bad. We couldn't determine where the fire was coming from, whether from the top of the bluff or from the summer beach-type homes on the shore. I just dropped myself into the sand and took my rifle and fired it at this house and Sergeant Wilkes asked, What are you firing at? And I said, 
I don't know. The only other live member of his assault team Roach could see was Pitgill Murdoch. The two men were lying together behind an obstacle. Murdoch had lost his glasses and could not see. Can you swim? Roach asked. No. Well, look, we can't stay here. There's nobody around here that seems to have any idea of what to do. Let's go back in the water and come in with the tide. They fell back and got behind a knocked-out tank. Both men were slightly wounded. The tide covered them and they hung onto the tank. Roach started to swim to shore. A coxswain from a Higgins boat picked him up about halfway in. He pulled me on board. It was around 10.30 and I promptly fell asleep. Roach eventually got up to the seawall where he helped the medics. The following day he caught up with what remained of his company. I met General Cota and I had a brief conversation with him. He asked me what company I was with and I told him and he just shook his head. Company A was just out of action. When we got together there were eight of us left from Company A ready for duty. Cota asked Roach what he was going to do when the war was over. Someday I'd like to go to college and graduate, Roach replied. I'd like to go to Fordham. Five years to the day later, Roach did graduate from Fordham. Over the years, he said in 1990, I don't think there has been a day that has gone by that I haven't thought of those men who didn't make it. Sight Lipolek's landing craft was about to swamp as it approached the shore. Everyone was bailing with helmets. We yelled to the crew to take us in. We would rather fight than drown. As the ramp dropped, we were hit by machine gun and rifle fire. I yelled to get ready to swim and fight. We were getting direct fire right into our craft. My three squad leaders in front and others were hit. Some men climbed over the side. Two sailors got hit. I got off in water only ankle deep, tried to run, but the water was suddenly up to my hips. I crawled to hide behind a steel beach obstacle. Bullets hit off it. Others hit more of my men. Got up to the beach to crawl behind the shingle, and a few of my men joined me. I took a head count, and there was only eleven of us left, from the thirty on the craft. As the tide came in, we took turns running out to the water's edge to drag wounded men to cover. Some of the wounded were hit again while on the beach. More men crowding up and crowding up. More people being hit by shell fire. People trying to help each other. While we were huddled there, I told Jim Hickey that I would like to live to be forty years old and work forty hours a week and make a dollar an hour. I felt, boy, I would really have it made at forty dollars a week. Company A had hardly fired a weapon. Almost certainly it had not killed any Germans. It had expected to move up the Veerville draw and be on top of the bluff by 0730. But at 0730 its handful of survivors were huddled up against the seawall, virtually without weapons. It had lost 96% of its effective strength. But its sacrifice was not in vain. The men had brought in rifles, bars, grenades, TNT charges, machine guns, mortars and mortar rounds, flamethrowers, rations and other equipment. This was now strewn across the sand at Dog Green. The weapons and equipment would make a life-or-death difference to the following waves of infantry, coming in at higher tide and having to abandon everything to make their way to shore. F Company, 116th, supposed to come in at Dog Red, landed near its target, astride the boundary between Dog Red and Easy Green. But G Company, supposed to be to the right of F at Dog White, drifted far left, so the two companies came in together, directly opposite the heavy fortifications at Les Moulins. There was a kilometre or so gap to each side of the intermixed companies, which allowed the German defenders to concentrate their fire. For the men of F and G companies, the 200 metres or more journey from the Higgins boats to the shingle was the longest and most hazardous trip they had ever experienced, or ever would. The lieutenant commanding the assault team on Sergeant Harry Bear's boat was killed as the ramp went down. As ranking non-com, Bear related, I tried to get my men off the boat and make it somehow to get under the seawall. We waded to the sand and threw ourselves down and the men were frozen, unable to move. My radio man had his head blown off three yards from me. The beach was covered with bodies, men with no legs, no arms. God, it was awful. 
When Bear finally made it to the seawall, dodging and ducking behind beach obstacles to get there, I tried to get the men organised. There were only six out of my boat alive. I was soaking wet, shivering, but trying like hell to keep control. I could feel the cold fingers of fear grip me. On the boat coming in, Port John Robertson of F Company was throwing up over the side. His sergeant yelled at him to get his head down. Robertson replied, I'm dying of seasickness. It won't make much difference. The coxswain hit a sandbar and shouted that he was unloading and getting the hell out of there. The ramp went down and our guys started jumping out in water up to their necks. Robertson was toward the rear of the boat. He saw his leader, Lieutenant Hilsher, get killed by an exploding shell. Then the flamethrower got blown up. Robertson jumped out. Despite his sixty pounds of ammunition and other equipment, he managed to struggle his way inland, to where the water was about a foot deep. I just lay there wondering what I was going to do. It wasn't long when I made a quick decision. Behind me, coming at me, was a Sherman tank with pontoons wrapped around it. I had two choices, get run over by the tank or run through the machine gun fire and the shelling. How I made it, I'll never know, but I got to the shingle and tried to survive. When Sergeant Warner Hamlet of F Company made it to the shore, he found that the weight of wet clothes, sand and equipment made it difficult to run. He could hear men shouting, get off the beach, and realised our only chance was to get off as quick as possible, because there we were, sitting ducks. He stumbled forward and saw a hole and jumped in. He landed on top of Pift O.T. Grimes. A shell exploded within ten metres of Hamlet, and blew his rifle from his hands while sending his helmet flying off his head. Crawling on his elbows and knees, he retrieved his rifle and helmet, then waited to regain his strength, and to see if my legs would support my weight. They did. By short leaps and advances, using obstacles for protection, he worked his way toward the shingle, while he was resting behind an obstacle. Private Gillingham, a young soldier, fell beside me, white with fear. He seemed to be begging for help with his eyes. I said, Gillingham, let's stay separated, cause the Germans will fire at two quicker than they will at one. He remained silent as I jumped and ran forward again. A shell burst between them. It took Gillingham's chin off, including the bone, except for a small piece of flesh. He tried to hold his chin in place as he ran toward the shingle. He made it, and Bill Hawkes and I gave him his morphine shot. We stayed with him for approximately thirty minutes until he died. The entire time he remained conscious and aware that he was dying. From the beach to the G.I.s, that shingle looked like the most desirable place in the world to be at that moment. But when they reached it, they found concertina wire covering it. No way to get across without blowing the wire. Nothing on the other side but more death and misery and although they were now protected from machine gun and rifle fire coming down from the German trenches on the bluff, they were exposed to mortar fire. The few who made it had no organisation, little or no leadership, only a handful of weapons. They could but huddle and hope for follow-up waves to bring in Bangalore torpedoes to blow the wire. E Company, 116th, landed farthest from its target. Scheduled to come in at Easy Green, it actually landed on the boundary between Easy Red and Fox Green, a kilometre off, and intermixed with men from the 16th Regiment, 1st Division. Pert, Harry Parley was a flamethrower, so far as he is aware, the only flamethrower to come off the beach unscathed. He landed with a pistol, a holster, a shovel, a May West, a raincoat, a canteen, a block of dynamite, and his 80-pound flamethrower. As our boat touched sand and the ramp went down, Parley recalled, I became a visitor to hell. Boats on either side were getting hit by artillery. Some were burning, others sinking. I shut everything out and concentrated on following the men in front of me down the ramp and into the water. He immediately sank. I was unable to come up. I knew I was drowning and made a futile attempt to unbuckle the flamethrower harness. A buddy grabbed his flamethrower and pulled Parley forward to where he could stand. Then slowly, half-drowned, coughing water and dragging my feet, I began walking toward the chaos ahead. 
He had 200 meters to go to the beach. He made it, exhausted. Machine gun fire was hitting the beach. As it hit the sand, it made a sip-sip sound like someone sucking on their teeth. To this day, I don't know why I didn't dump the flamethrower and run like hell for shelter. But I didn't. He was behind the other members of the team. Months later, trying to analyse why I was able to safely walk across the beach while others running ahead were hit, I found a simple answer. The Germans were directing their fire down onto the beach so that the line of advancing attackers would run into it, and since I was behind, I was ignored. In short, the burden on my back may well have saved my life. When Parley reached the shingle, he found chaos. Men were trying to dig or scrape trenches or foxholes for protection from the mortars. Others were carrying or helping the wounded to shelter. We had to crouch or crawl on all fours when moving about. To communicate, we had to shout above the din of the shelling from both sides as well as the explosions on the beach. Most of us were in no condition to carry on. We were just trying to stay alive. The enormity of our situation came as I realised that we had landed in the wrong sector and that many of the people around me were from other units and strangers to me. What's more, the terrain before us was not what I had been trained to encounter. I remember removing my flamethrower and trying to dig a trench while lying on my stomach. Failing that, I searched and found a discarded bar, but we could see nothing above us to return the fire. We were the targets. Parley lay behind the shingle, scared, worried, and often praying. Once or twice I was able to control my fear enough to race across the sand to drag a helpless G.I. from drowning in the incoming tide. That was the extent of my bravery that morning. Not true, as will be seen. Captain Lawrence Madill of E Company was urging his men forward. One of the episodes I remember the most was debarking from the landing craft and trying to take shelter from the enemy fire behind one of their obstacles, recalled Walter A. Smith. Captain Medill came up behind me and others, ordering all that could move to get off the beach. I looked up at him, and his left arm appeared to be almost blown off. Madill made it to the seawall, where he discovered that one of his company mortars had also made it but had no ammunition. He ran back to the beach to pick up some rounds. As he was returning, he was hit by machine gun fire. Before he died, Madil gasped. Senior non-com, take the men off the beach. As what was left of A, F, G and E companies of the 116th huddled behind obstacles or the shingle, the following waves began to come in. B and H companies at 07 Tiao, D at 07 to 10, C, K, I and M at 0720. Not one came in on target. The coxswains were trying to dodge obstacles and incoming shells, while the smoke drifted in and out and obscured the landmarks and what few marker flags there were on the beach. On the command boat, for B Company, the CO, Capt Ettore Zappacosta, heard the British coxswain cry out, We can't go in there. We can't see the landmarks. We must pull off. Zappacosta pulled his Colt 45 and ordered, By God, you'll take this boat straight in. The coxswain did. When the ramp dropped, Zappacosta was first off. He was immediately hit. Medic Thomas Kenzer saw him bleeding from hip and shoulder. Kenzer, still on the ramp, shouted, Try to make it in, I'm coming. But the captain was already dead. Before Kenzer could jump off the ramp, he was shot dead. Every man in the boat, save one, was either killed or wounded before reaching the beach. Nineteen-year-old Pert Harold Baumgarten of B Company got a bullet through the top of his helmet while jumping from the ramp, then another hit the receiver of his M1 as he carried it at port arms. He waded through the waist-deep water as his buddies fell alongside him. Sergeant Clarence Pilgrim Robertson had a gaping wound in the upper right corner of his forehead. He was walking crazily in the water. Then I saw him get down on his knees and start praying with his rosary beads. At this moment, the Germans cut him in half with their deadly crossfire. Baumgarten had drawn a Star of David on the back of his field jacket, with the Bronx, New York, written on it. That would let Hitler know who he was. He was behind an obstacle. He saw the reflection from the helmet of one of the German rifflemen on the bluff, and took aim and later on I found out I got a bullseye on him. 
That was the only shot he fired because his damaged rifle broke in two when he pulled the trigger. Shells were bursting about him. I raised my head to curse the Germans when an 88 shell exploded about 20 yards in front of me, hitting me in my left cheek. It felt like being hit with a baseball bat, only the results were much worse. My upper jaw was shattered, the left cheek blown open, my upper lip was cut in half. The roof of my mouth was cut up and teeth and gums were laying all over my mouth. Blood poured freely from the gaping wound. The tide was coming in. Baumgarten washed his face with the cold, dirty channel water and managed not to pass out. The water was rising about an inch a minute, so he had to get moving or drown. He took another hit from a bullet in the leg. He moved forward in a dead man's float with each wave of the incoming tide. He finally reached the seawall where a medic dressed his wounds. Mortars were coming in, and I grabbed the medic by the shirt to pull him down. He hit my hand away and said, You're injured now. When I get hurt, you can take care of me. Sergeant Benjamin McKinney was a combat engineer attached to C Company. When his ramp dropped, I was so seasick I didn't care if a bullet hit me between the eyes and got me out of my misery. As he jumped off the ramp, rifle and machine gun fire hit it like rain falling. Ahead, it looked as if all the first wave were dead on the beach. He got to the shingle. He and Sergeant Storms saw a pillbox holding a machine gun and a rifleman about 30 metres to the right, spraying the beach with their weapons. Storms and McKinney crawled toward the position. McKinney threw hand grenades as Storms put rifle fire into it. Two Germans jumped out. Storms killed them. The 116th was starting to fight back.